the last 10 months in a unique project, this once deserted farm has been brought back to life as it would have been in the 1880s. G up! <sighs> Ruth Goodman, Peter Ginn, and Alex Langlands have been living the lives of Victorian farmers from the depths of winter to the warmth of summer, turning the clock back to rediscover an age gone by. <laughs> They've restored the farm under the watchful eye of their landlord, Thomas Stackhouse Acton. I think it's slightly tilted. <laughs> and experienced life without modern conveniences. Bathing in a room with no central heating. It's pretty cold. Successfully bred Victorian breeds of poultry, sheep... Little friends, look at those. ..cattle and pigs. A little curious and fluffy and <laughs> cute and cuddly. But the dreadful June weather devastated the hay harvest. It's not cutting, is it? No, it's not. It's so wet as well. Yeah. I mean, look, Peter's wringing it out there. For the Victorian farmer, this is a disaster, leaving him no hay store to feed the animals over winter. Rain, 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 rain. Let's hope it doesn't affect the wheat, eh? Now it's late summer, and the year-long project is almost at an end. But first, the team faces their biggest challenge yet, the wheat harvest. Only a bumper wheat crop can offset the failure of the hay harvest. First, they must make some urgent repairs to their cart. Water. Then get to grips with cutting-edge technology, Victorian style. <laughs> We've had a blockage. Brian's just going around the machine to try and work out what it is. But most importantly, they need a break in the rain. We've only got a very small window between now and when those clouds come over. A failed wheat crop could mean the workhouse for a Victorian farmer. It's early July. The wheat was planted back in September and has survived the harsh winter weather as well as attacks by pheasants and rabbits. Now it needs to ripen from green to the familiar golden colour. Wow, this is amazing. This really is. It's a bit of a dream come true, this. This is actually probably better than I expected. But with harvest maybe four to six weeks away, weather depending, we've... Um, Still got so many things that could go wrong. If we don't get the harvest right, we cut it too late, it's too dry, you know, if we cut it too soon, it's too green, it won't thresh. Fingers crossed, uh, I'll get it right and I won't look like too much of an idiot. If it's harvested at the right time, the wheat grain from the heads will be sold to make flour for bread. But wheat must be dry before it can be cut. If rain delays the harvest, all it will be fit for is animal feed. This acre of wheat would take our farmers a week of back-breaking work to harvest by hand. But in the 1880s came this, the horse-drawn reaper binder. As its name suggests, it not only cuts the wheat, but binds it into sheaves too, harvesting an acre in as little as an hour. What a contraption. It's amazing, isn't it? It's like something out of a Wallace and Gromit movie, isn't it? <laughs> All these gadgets and levers and wheels and cogs. Got the cutting face down there, the yep. blade's going across. So it takes the wheat up and spits it out the other side, bound somehow. So this is the real labour-saving device. It means that we don't have to run around the field bunching all this stuff up and tying it ourselves. Putting this Victorian contraption back in action is going to be no mean feat. So local farmer Mr Thomas and his son Brian have offered to help. Now, you've used one of these, haven't you? Yeah, my father had. Yes, yes right. I've used one of these you have. several years, and with horses. With horses? Right. Oh, yes, 1936 when I started right. using one like. And we went on into the... 50s? Yes. Winding her down into her working position, approximately. Keep going till them wheels is off the ground. That's it, yeah, you're going down now, lovely. 
She's quite heavy, isn't she? She is, yeah. Do you prefer working with horses or tractors? I had it a lot easier with tractors. Was it? It was. <laughs> you can get on the seat and ride all day. Yeah. So what's the next job, then? Uh, we're going to put the knife in now. Uh, Alex will bring him round to us. We'll pop him in. Yep. Be very careful of that. It's sharp. Yep. Right. Good. Right, so we're ready to cut now, are we? No. Gotta no. get the string in. We've got to have the string in and thread right. it through the okay. needle and through the knot. Yeah. Strings in here. Yes. And it's got to end up where Alex is. This oh. ingenious knotter ties the cut wheat into bundles. Through there, exactly, yes. Invented in 1857 by an 18 year old Wisconsin farmhand, it was a revolutionary breakthrough. Have you done this job before, Peter, or not? Uh, no, no, I've, I've never no. done this before. Well, you're quite a professional at it. I think you seem to. <laughs> Thank you for It's completely under control. So I think I might need to pass over to you, Alex. Yes. Okay. Alex, yes. yes. Lift the hatch and right. just get down in there. You'll see it coming through there now, Alex. Can you yeah, see that all there? Hatch up. Yeah, you've got I've the got hatch up. Right, OK. And it's basically like a, like a giant sewing machine, this mechanism, That's right. Right. isn't it? This is the yes. most complicated yes. part of the whole procedure. Yes. Right. Exactly. Well, pull a bit more out, Charlie. You haven't got enough to... A little that bit more, more there. That better. Right, yeah. hold, hold it tight. And Pete is going to turn over manually just to check yes. if right. it works OK. Here it comes. Yes. Oh, no. Oh, no. No, it's clear. Uh, yeah, it shouldn't be a problem tight. there, Pete. Let's no. try it again, then. Let's, let's, try it again. Pull, let's pull that. It shouldn't make any difference in here. Oh. When was this machine last used? Have you any idea? Maybe we should try it then with a, yes. you think, with a sheave? Yeah, I should put a straw yeah. in it. Yeah, a yeah. sheave. Okay. Right okay. on there, right. basically. Ready yes, ready to go. Yes. yes. She tied it, yes. And we have a shove tied. Yes. yes. <laughs> Look. Excellent. Lovely. Look at that. I'll nut it up properly. See? Yeah. Yes. That's brilliant. That is yeah, going to save us good. an enormous amount of time. Really good. Mm -hmm. So is it good to see this working again after so many years? Oh, yes. It's very nice to see it working like the boy said. <laughs> yes. But I, I wouldn't like to go out and work with it all day now. No. <laughs> <laughs> Straw, the stem of the wheat plant, will be a byproduct of the harvest once the valuable grain is removed. Ruth is keen to put it to good use. Local craft expert Anne Dyer is visiting the farm to teach Ruth straw plaiting. Hello! Hello! How to see meet you. Yes. Oh, thank you so much for coming. I see you brought straw. Yes. Most of my female ancestors, if you go back into the Victorian period, were straw platters. The men were labourers and the women were well, straw platters. Well, it should be in your hands, my dear. Oh, I hope so. I've started a bit because it's easier to plait once it's begun. And you know it has to be kept slightly damp, no, otherwise it'll I didn't. crack. Oh right. And when okay. it's look how pliable that is. And that doesn't make it rot then, just being nope. wet all the time. Well, think of the English weather. Yeah, that is a point. <laughs> now you've got seven straws, mm -hmm. so you've got four on one side and three on the other. Yeah. And you're going to keep moving one to the other side, and whichever side you've got most on is the side you plait from. So it's right. easy; you can't lose yourself. <laughs> but I can. Oh, you made it look so easy. Hang on. Ah, well, it's a few hundred miles of plaiting. It <laughs> the uh, thing. That's right. Now keep them at right angles. This is this is addictive. You don't have to do this sitting down. No, do you? no. A bag on one arm to put the finished plait in, and your bundle of damp straws under your arm. And you can go it's... walk about. Yeah. Mm. So you get these groups of young women behaving just like teenage gangs on street corners do today, intimidating everybody who walks past. And nobody could really shout at them because they were earning good money. They were working. When you've got your 50-yard bundle and you can sell it, sell it. And you've got money for the groceries, now you know how to plait, you know how to sew, so you know everything you need. <laughs> everything and I, I need. I brought my husband's hat. Oh, my to goodness. See. So a hat is just like, it's just a spiral. Of yeah. straw, mm. plait. And then you sew it as you go. So you're not moulding it over anything, you're just bending no. it no. in your hands. Mm. And a skilled person would get a perfect shape. Ah, I thought there was all sorts of clever machinery. So how much of this do I have to make before I can make a hat? Depends how big the hat is, of course. But a, a, just a nice little small one, probably about 15 yards, 20 yards. 15 yards for a small hat? Yeah. Mm. And I've done... Three inches. <laughs> yes. 
I really want to have a real okay. proper go at this. We've got all this straw out in the field. There's no excuse. Yes. yes. To carry the harvested wheat from the field, the Victorian farmers need a cart, or dray. But theirs has lain unused for decades, and Peter is unsure of the condition of its wheels. So he's visiting Mike Wright, the wheelwright, for advice. How are you? Hello, Peter. So we've got a wheat harvest that we want to bring in, yeah. and for that we're going to use our dray. Yeah. But I've had a look at it, and the wheels are a bit wobbly. I was wondering if you could come as a wheelwright and cast your expert eye over it. Yeah. The thing is, I, I know so little about wheelwriting. I'd, I'd love a quick sort of demonstration, actually. All right. Yes. Well, obviously, we start with the hub and work outwards uh, to the spokes and the fellies, which are the wooden rim around the side. Right. The hub is made of elm because elm's got a very twisted grain and it, it doesn't split easily when the spokes are driven into it. Right, OK. The, the, the spokes are, are made of oak for strength. Yeah, so the, all the power of the wheel, the weight, is just transferred down the grain. Yeah. The rim of the wheel, or fellows as they're called. Fellows, right. Yeah. They're made of ash. So there's three different woods. You've got elm, oak and ash. Ash, uh, ash is quite flexible, isn't it? That's the reason that it's used. It takes the shocks of the road better than anything else. Uh, once we've got that on, we've got to make sure all these tongues are engaged. Right. And then tap them up gradually all the way around, close all the joints. Well, this looks pretty complete as a wheel, but you, you don't use glue or nails, so how do you hold it all together? Well, we hold it together with the metal tyre that goes around the outside. Right. Uh, this is made smaller than the wheel, okay. and uh, it's normally heated to red hot so that it expands sufficiently to go over the wheel, and then cooled quickly so that it shrinks and pulls all the joints up tight and holds the whole wheel under tension. And so this would be red hot as it was going absolutely, on? Absolutely, yeah. And then yeah. it would start to cool? Yeah, and draw these joints up tight. And there we have a wheel. Yeah, and you can see it's quite... And that, that tyre really ties it all together, doesn't it? That's right. It's a very effective way of clamping up the whole wheel. I have to say, on our dray, there's, there's a bit of a gap, actually. It's not as tight as this, so it might be the tyre that's a problem. That's it. That's it. It's a bit, actually, we need to lift it a bit more, really, but that'll do it. This one, the tyre is a little bit loose, so I think we need to take that one off and uh, retire it. Yeah, the last thing we want is our dray to fall apart. As the year on the farm draws to a close, Ruth is keen to try something different in the Victorian kitchen. Curries were really popular in Victorian Britain. Um, all the recipe books are full of them. Indeed, the first curry house was opened in London in 1811. This one calls for powdered ginger, uh, turmeric and cayenne pepper, all of which were relatively cheap. So now I've coated the chicken pieces in the my curry powder, my mix of spices, they're to be browned or fried in butter, along with lots of onion and garlic. I'm just popping the chicken into the melted butter, and I shall brown those off. Oh, back on the stove. And you find recipes in Mrs. Beaton, in Mrs. Rundle, Eliza Acton, and also the family save all using leftovers, using a huge variety of meats, fish, even curried eggs. They're nice, I like curried eggs. Curries are also one of the few times in which the Victorian recipes include garlic. It's only supposed to be the one clove, so let's make the most of it. Now I've got my stock pot here, I've just got some chicken stock. Just go straight in. These are the onions that have been cooked through, browned off in the rest of the butter and spices. And they go in too. And then in my marrow. And this is all going to stew down now for about 45 minutes to an hour. And it'll reduce as it does so that the stock, combining with the spices, will make the sauce. This is our dry tyre. 
Just taking it round to the forge. The metal tyre's been removed, repaired, and is ready to go back onto the wooden wheel. Hi, Mike. Hi, Peter. Well, I've got the tyre. All right. So it'll drop over like that. Right. You can see it's too small to go over at the moment. Yeah. But when it's hot, hopefully it'll be big enough to drop over. So when it gets hot, it'll expand. It'll expand. Bigger in the wheel. Yeah. And then it contracts and clamps. Yeah. A hundred years ago, we would have been using the uh, Shrewsbury Chronicle, not the Shropshire Star. <laughs> Plenty of sticks around the outside, wigwam fashion. Right. Fill up all the gaps so that the wind can't get into it. We're now going to light our fire. Feeling a bit nervous about this, actually. Uh, it's, uh, there's nothing to it. <laughs> Take your word for it. <laughs> Let the air get to it a bit more yet. I have to say, I'm starting to feel my eyes beginning to melt. Yeah, I think it's, <laughs> it's getting hot. It's time to move back a little bit, I think. Yeah. I, I, seriously, the, the heat of this fire, I cannot exaggerate how intense this heat is. In an effort to retain my facial hair, and I have had it burnt off before, I'm just putting a bit of water on my face and my hands. So. That just gives me a little bit of extra protection against the fire when I go in with the tongs. So I'll keep my eyelashes, I'll keep my eyebrows, and I'll keep my beard. And unlike Mike, I'll keep my hair. You ready, Peter? I'm ready. We've got to right. go for it now. Grab one of these. Of the essence. Just raking the fire off the top of the tyre. One on. Well, just hang on. Oh, ready? Ready? Ready. Joint on the middle. Yeah. Okay. Right, pressure all's out. Knock it down with a hammer this side. Hang on, wait, wait. Do you want to? Water. Just evenly applying water here. This is just shrinking the tyre into place. As you can see, by the water boiling, as soon as it hits the tyre, it's still red hot. There was actually so much of a gap around the outside, I didn't think actually it was ever going to close up, but it is starting to close up now. It is. Looks after the water touches it. It's still bone dry. That was very, very intense. Are you happy with that, Mike? Yeah, it seems fine. Um, it's still quite warm to the touch. Yeah, it is. The water did work on my face, although now it's been replaced with a sheen of sweat. <laughs> Right, one wheel, one cart jack. This is the wheel we've retired, and Mike's very kindly helping me put it back on the dray. That'll do. Wonderful. And we just slip the wheel on. And now the linchpin. Position. Wheel on. Wheel on. Yep. Hopefully this means that uh, we'll have a working dray for our wheat harvest. Right, that's up. Trestle out. Trestle out. Wheel down. Right there. Job done. With both the dray and reaper binder up and running, Peter and Alex head back to the cottage to plan the harvest with Ruth over a curry. Smells very good. Curry always smells good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I never thought on this Victorian farm we'd be sitting down to curry. Eat curry. Oh, it was really <laughs> popular. Good old Victorians. <laughs> they were quite cosmopolitan in their food. I mean, if you go through Eliza Acton's recipe book, 
You can find food from about 20 different countries. Well, they're quite cosmopolitan in what they called the British Empire. Well, exactly. What are we going to do about harvest then? I mean, even with the Reaper binder, we're going to need quite a lot of extra labour, aren't we? Yes. I suppose you'll, you'll want less than you would do if you were doing it entirely mm. by hand, mm. but more than you would do if you were doing it in with modern, modern equipment. Yeah. yeah. But then if we do have help, we should really have a party to say thank you. A harbour shopper. And equally, it's, it's uh, the end of our, our year here. Mm. So it would be could... nice to say thank you to people, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we can't afford to pay people much, so how on earth are we going to... Well, I think we're going to have to pay them with the party. And the party's got to consist of good food, good beer and good music. OK, good food, <laughs> reasonably passable homebrew <laughs> and good music. <laughs> So you're going to have a crack at some beer then? I think we should have a crack at some beer. OK. Mm. Also, how many Victorian farm labourers are wandering around in the 21st century, so... <laughs> <laughs> they might be quite difficult to come by. Well, yeah, they might be, mightn't they? So how are we going to get them to come then? Do you think poster? We could get a poster. Advert? It was a very Victorian thing to do, ad mm. advertise. In print, you know, in print, isn't it? I mean, there are adverts for everything, everywhere. First great age of advertising. Yeah. So they say. Hmm. Apparently farmers could read. Well, yeah. I might learn soon. <laughs> so when are you opening your curry house? It's all right, isn't it? It's delicious. Mm. Very sort of English curry, but... Mm. To attract help with the harvest, Peter and Alex are making beer, Victorian style. The first job is to heat malted barley in water. Oh, smells delicious, doesn't it? Yeah, that smells fantastic. It's a bit like Ovaltine, isn't it? Yeah. Milk drink, hot milk drink. Hot milk drink. Hot, hot, hot. I'm getting tipsy just making it. We need to keep that temperature at that 150 degrees. We need to do that for two hours. The yeah, temperature is critical because if, if it's too much, it kills the enzymes. If it's too little, uh, the enzymes won't work. But 150 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, the enzymes will release sugars from the barley into the water create the sugar water, which is the wort. Basically, this sugar is what the yeast feeds on, and that reaction creates the alcohol. Back in the Victorian period, you were very much responsible for providing not only for the, the, the sort of financial needs of your, your labourers, but also for their refreshments as well. And if you brewed a good beer, then there's a very good chance that you get all the best labourers. That smells absolutely lovely. It does. And it's holding its temperature well, or at least it has done now, and it's been pushing three hours. Yeah, it should be fine. Well, the big problem now is, is straining it into the cauldron. OK. Because you'd normally have a hole in the bottom and stuff it with straw. Right. But obviously our, our wooden vessel leaked, so we couldn't use that. <laughs> I found this. <laughs> is that what I think it is? Top of roost chamber pot. <laughs> is it? I hope you've given it a thorough cleaning. <laughs> Let's go for it. Go for this. <laughs> Just don't tell anyone. <laughs> if that has been used in anger, I think you might want to give it a, a, a slightly more thorough rinse. <laughs> Let's put, I'll pop it in the cauldron. Brilliant. Sterilisation begins. Nobody will ever know. While the boys battle with the beer, Ruth heads off to a printer's shop in nearby Blist Hill. Good morning. Good morning. And how can I help you? Um, I've come to order a poster, if possible, please. Yes, to yes. Put up. Uh, what sort of size we're looking at? Oh, I don't know. Sort of poster size. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, it's for the farm, for Glebe Farm. Glebe Farm, yes. Um, and we want some harvest help. Now the boys think that we might have trouble getting labourers, so they said we've got to make this poster really, like, really attractive. They suggested we put something like, you know, that the best beer around was on. That certainly attracted them in. The best beer around. <laughs> Here we have. Uh, cases of type. This case here contains all the capital letters and this one here contains all those small letters. So printers often call this the uppercase and the lowercase letter. Oh, I see, that's what it means. So what we do yeah, is, and we're going to set the word Glebe Farm here. So we pick up a G from the compartment and put it into our stick. Now what it is, you hold the stick in your left hand and you work away from your body. So yeah. we're going to put the next one is the L. So we're following it to each one, L, E, B, we're in the lowercase here, 
Yeah. Right, so we've done the word glee. We need to put spacing material in here, so we're putting two pieces of paste, space material, and then we're going to do the word farm. Capital F again, that uppercase, okay. F, A, R, M. So there you are. We've now completed our type. Now it looks as if it's upside down, but when you turn the stick around like that, you can actually see that it is backwards. Uh, right. And so you, when you were doing that, you were spelling it out in order. You weren't trying to spell no, it backwards, no, no, were no, you? No, no. Oh, that would make it so much easier. Yeah, this is where the <laughs> poor old apprentice often got this wrong. If you have a look at this, <laughs> this is a name of our shop. This was done by an apprentice who simply started, started the wrong end of the stick or got the wrong end of the stick. Oh, I see. So that's, that's where the staying comes from, getting the wrong end of the stick, starting the wrong end. Yeah. Put these coins in. The 19th century saw the first great age of advertising, and almost all of it was in printed form. As well as posters, masses of printed leaflets, junk mail, flowed through the Victorian postal system. You're going to have to use all your strength. That's half a tonne of pressure. Let's see how we've done with your first poster. Oh, talk about half a tonne of pressure. Look how that's come through. There you are. Oh, fantastic! Great. Right, well, I'll just get these stuck up round the village, I think. Well, I suppose as Victorians, if we, if we got good at brewing beer, we could invest in the proper kit. <laughs> Back at the cottage, the malted barley is filtered from the water, drop by drop. This is tedious. That is a bit, isn't it? But we can always just tip it through the... Can you say the pillow case? Genius idea. Let's innovate. I'll nick this off Ruth's bed. And pour it in there. Necessity is the mother of all invention. That's good, I think. Leave that at that. Hmm. Pillow case seems to be waterproof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think put the hops. <laughs> in here. We've still got to drain it though, haven't we? <laughs> We've still got to drain the water out at some point. <laughs> I think at this rate we're going to be lucky if we've got any beer for harvest. <laughs> Don't say that. Eventually, the barley's filtered out. Next, it's time to flavour the beer. This is going to give it the bitterness and also the hoppy taste. Yep. But we're going for the bittersweet, aren't we? We are, summer beer and all that. Put in some honey. Brilliant, some honey. Yeah, well, we've got it's so much of it at the moment. Honey's the only ingredient in the world that doesn't go off in its raw form. This is our yeast. So I'm just going to put this into the beer. And I'll just stir the yeast into the wort. And the wort is sugar water, and the yeast feeds off of that sugar. And the result of that is alcohol. So this is it. This is now beer. It is in the lap of the gods. There's nothing more we can do for this. Hey, piggies. This is the barley from our brew. And one of the things Victorian farmers would have done with it is feed it to the pigs, because pigs pretty much eat anything. And look at them, they are really, really tucking in. I mean, malted barley, it's like Maltesers. It's like Ovaltine, it's, it's a malt extract, it's lovely. And they're absolutely scoffing it. <laughs> With the piglets weaned, it's time they were fattened for slaughter. In just a few weeks, the team will leave, so Merle Wilson from a local farm has come to collect the pigs. Oh, hi, Merle. Hey, anybody back? Hi, how are you? Not so bad. They're very good, aren't they? They are, they're lovely. Absolutely lovely. Have you just weaned them? Yeah, pretty much. What are you going to do with them? Well, I think I'm going to fatten some up, yeah. see how, what they're like, because we haven't had glosterol spots before. But I'm going to keep one female to breed from. Right. Right, should we take them over? Yeah, do you think they'll follow? Yeah, I think so. Come, pigs. So uh, I suppose you'll miss these pigs, will you? Immensely. More, more than you'll know, I suppose. Yeah, this is goodbye. This is it, really. But that's way farming. 
I know. It is the way of farming. If, you, if they've had a good life, that's the main thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, I better get behind them. Come on! Pig, 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 pig! Come on! Come on! Come on, boys, you've got a long walk. Come on! Come on! Big, Come on, pigs. Big, 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 As well as the nurtured wheat crop, the nearby hills of the Long Mind have their own natural harvest, winberries. This is a place where, in the summer, women and children came to pick a free harvest, a free cash crop, actually. It had quite a good commercial value. I'm picking, well, locally they're called winberries. Um, in much of Britain they're called bilberries. Winberries are pretty much the same thing as American blueberries. Oddly, many British people know American blueberries and don't know our own native version. Our native version is a little bit smaller, but I think it tastes nicer. In the 19th century, this whole moorland was managed for grouse, and they would burn sections of it year after year to take the big vegetation out and allow fresh young growth to come. And that, incidentally, by the by, is really good conditions for the windberry bushes to grow. So you get this huge berry harvest all over the tops of these hills. You don't have to plant anything, you don't have to weed anything, you don't have to fertilise anything, you don't need any machines, it's just there, free! And what made it commercially viable, as opposed to just, you know, local produce for local people, is the railway down at the bottom which meant that great big baskets and crates full of Wimbrys could be whisked off to London, where you could get really good money from the restaurant trade. As July ends, the wheat is turning golden and will soon be ready to harvest. The harvest will be the culmination of their year as Victorian farmers. It's, it's been a fabulous year, but it's, it's going to be a wrench having to leave this farm. And one thing I really have learnt is that farming isn't a job. Farming is a lifestyle, and it is totally engaging. We'll be back in the, uh, the real world soon, and uh, I don't know how I'm going to uh, react to having to go back to modern living. I've enjoyed Victorian farming so much, uh, so it's going to be quite a shock to the system. But, of course, we've still got the wheat harvest to do, and, uh, you know, I'm very anxious about that, what with the weather at the moment. The wheat must be dry, otherwise the reaper binder will jam. But the prospects aren't good. The summer's been one of the wettest for years. Despite anxieties about the weather, the preparations for the harvest are going well. The posters are up around the village, so hopefully they'll get some much needed help. The horse-drawn dray and reaper binder are set to go. And Ruth's beginning preparations for the harvest festival, making Winbury jam. Winburys don't have very much pectin, which is the thing that makes the jam set. So I'm going to use some apple peel and apple cores to produce some pectin. So all I've got to do is take all my corings and my peelings and let them simmer in some water. And then the water will become the water that I make my jam with. And hey presto, a set will occur. Pectin is something which occurs naturally in lots of fruit. And when you boil it up, the liquid and the pectin react with the acids in the fruit and it turns into a jelly. I'm gonna put all the peelings in a cloth, just makes it easier with the straining afterwards. Pop that on the range and boil it for a couple of hours. Last of my Wimbris. All the fruit in top of my nice pectiny water. And I need to weigh the sugar. And as with most jam, it's basically the same amount of sugar as fruit. Earlier centuries, sugar had been expensive and jam had been a luxury product. But with slavery 
and uh, new machines in the sugar refineries and better transport bringing the sugar back. Sugar had become a cheap mass ingredient in Britain. So bread and jam was something that many a person who couldn't afford a joint of mutton turned to. The sheep have been one of the great success stories of this Victorian farm. The initial flock of 10 has grown to 26. Back in April, Alex sowed them a nutritious pasture to graze, using grasses developed in the Victorian era. But with a year on the farm drawing to a close, it's time for them to be taken away by sheep farmer Richard Spencer. So what do you think of some of these lambs then, Richard? Well, you've got one or two outstanding specimens in there. There's, there's, there's one of those ewe lambs. It's an absolute beauty. It, it's as good as anything I've, I've bred this year. I'm very impressed with what you've done. Richard's also impressed by Alex's pasture. Good thick bite of grass there. See well, the clovers come through. <laughs> well, those deep-rooted plants, they'll get down and pull the trace elements up. Your, your sheep couldn't wish for better. And it's just what you need to sort of get these lambs to finish. I'm, I'm very impressed, Alex. I'm very impressed. Well done, Pete. Thank you very much. Richard's advised enclosing the sheep in a small area and moving it every day. This is a valuable feed for your sheep. Right. And if you put them on here, they'll come in here hungry, they'll eat it down, then tomorrow they'll move them on to the next piece. And also, with them being on continually fresh grazing, which in effect it is, there's no chance for a parasite problem to develop. Right. Let's just have a look and see what yeah. the condition's like on the back. So we're going to catch one of those lambs and we're going to see what it feels like and we'll see if it's ready for the butcher. Jolly good. Are you ready? Let's go for it. Oh, that's one. Go, man, go, 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 go. Where are you, Alex? Good grief, young man. <laughs> Youth. <laughs> You don't do them are no match for age and treachery. Dear goodness gracious <laughs> me. He's a tough one, isn't he? I won't. Do you know? That will do. That will do. I won't tell your mother. He's a tough one. Right, fellow, this, isn't is, he? this is just about right. You put your hands on there. Yep. Right across there, right. where, where mine are. Yep. You can feel the meat. It's about like that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, if you put your hands there. Yep. That is wonderful. That is solid meat in there. That is a very nice ram lamb, actually. It's not wool, it's firm flesh. Yeah. I'm quite, quite impressed with that. You've got some absolutely wonderful lambs there. There's always one or two that aren't as, as good as the others. It's a fact of life. I mean, I was a run to the litter, but I survived. <laughs> so there. we'd stand up then as, mm. as, as Victorian shepherds? Mm. Mm. You would. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Hold our own. Absolutely. Thank you ever so much, Richard. Absolute pleasure. Absolute yes. pleasure. Well done, Alex. Well Thank done, you. Pete. Well done. Back at the farm, Ruth has been bitten by the straw platting bug. This straw platter has really turned out to be addictive. I find myself doing it all the time. And it's quite nice using our straw. And look, oh, I've nearly finished it. It actually looks like a hat! <laughs> I'm so pleased with it. I really... I just, when I started sewing it together, I thought, well, you know, if I just make a disc shape, that'd be something. But as I sort of worked it, it, it just sort of happened and came together. It's quite fetching. Ding! On top of head. <laughs> I think really though, if I want to be Victorian, I ought to wear it with a big bow, sort of tied round, and then it should come under my chin, which pushes the hat into a different shape, sort of, sort of bit like that. <laughs> it's the 1st of August. Known as Lammas Day, this was traditionally the start of the wheat harvest season. If the next few days stay dry, this will be the best time to reap the crop. To celebrate Lammas Day, Alex and Peter are ringing the church bells under the watch of Warden Edward Jones. Well, we've had a few practices, and uh, I think last night we were sort of almost there, weren't we? Did very we well almost. last night. Almost. Yes. <laughs> we're going to get it right today. Yes, we are indeed. <laughs> and you're going to ring the tenor bell, Peter. That's the heaviest bell, half a ton weight. Wonderful. Uh, Rupert's on the treble, the first bell, and Alex on the middle bell. Right, so I'll uh, set the pace with the treble bell and I'll try and keep it as slow as possible because I'm aware that your, your bell is the, is the heaviest. And uh, we have to try and keep up with each other. That's right. Look to treble going, treble gone. I'm really just trying to concentrate on getting a nice even ring. All the while I'm watching Rupert so that my Sally's going just after his, which it isn't at the moment. Making 
quite a racket in there, aren't they? <laughs> They're doing a wonderful job. Professor Ronald Hutton is an expert in British rituals. What exactly is it that they're doing? Well, you ring the bells twice, traditionally. You ring the bells at Lammas, the loaf mass, which is the 1st of August, mm -hmm. to announce the beginning of the harvest. And then in this parish, uh, you'd ring the bells at the end of harvest to announce uh, the fact it was over for everybody. This is a relatively new custom. It's part of the Harvest Festival, which doesn't come in until the 1840s to the 1860s. Oh, right. And that's to get over the commercialisation of agriculture in the mm. early 19th century. More and more harvest hands are accepting extra cash instead of a harvest supper, which makes sense. Yeah. But it doesn't loosen that sense of community. So what happens instead is the entire parish gets together to have a general harvest celebration when everybody's finished reaping. Oh, that's Everybody nice, pays a bit it? towards it okay. and it restores that sense of an organic community. And it works so well, we're still doing it. Uh, how did we do then, Mr well, Jones? Well, it wasn't too bad. There's room for improvement. <laughs> It's harvest time. The rain's held off and the wheat is dry enough to cut. Local farmer Brian Davis and his daughter Sharon have come to drive the reaper binder. Powered by three horses, it cuts and ties the wheat into sheaves, doing the job of dozens of workers. Such an amazing piece of kit. That is just I mean, tremendous. I, I was hoping it would work. Why are you just so fast? Whoosh! <laughs> but with just one row done, the Reaper Binder comes to a shuddering halt. Back! 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 <laughs> We've had a blockage. And Brian's just going round the machine to try and work out what it is. And there's another problem brewing on the horizon. Rain. Do you want to take it out of gear, Brian? And just A downpour it? now will threaten the whole harvest. The problem here is we've only got a very small window between now and when those clouds come over. We really don't want to get uh, to caught in a thunderstorm. We'll play back a bit, Alex. Oh, it can't be in Oh, yes. So it's the land that's locked up. No. It's, right, it's, going, right, it's going now. Yeah. So it was a blockage? Yeah, blockage on the knife. Go. Gee up. Gee up. Weeds amongst the crop caused the jam. But with a storm closing in, they can't afford another hitch. Time for urgent action. We were desperately keen to try and avoid this kind of harvesting. This really is sort of early 19th century style harvesting, all by hand. But the reason we've had to do this is because we fertilised this patch along here. And what we've really done is we've fertilised the weeds as well. And one of the weeds that we've got in here is a field vetch. And that is a real pain to farmers. So what we can do is just clean ourselves a nice kind of swathe through here, if you like. With the weeds cleared, the reaper binder can cut without risk of jamming. In less than an hour, the job's done, and only just in time. Well, here comes the rain. Hopefully it won't be too much of a heavy shower, but it doesn't look good, does it? This has been probably one of the most stressful things. After the disaster of the hay crop because of the weather, we just, um, you know, this has just been so stressful. That was pretty quick, but it I think stooking is going to take us a bit yeah. of time. It is. And the rain's the coming. To give us a hand, we can get everyone we can Everybody. get. They're yeah. loitering there with intent. <laughs> You're going to help us stook? Can you help yeah. Us? We need to do it really fast. Ruth's poster hasn't produced any harvest labourers yet, so it's all hands on deck. It's really important that we upend and stook all the wheat so that the wheat is up in the air where it can be dried. If we left it down on the ground, it would start to rot. Up like this, it can dry out, plenty of air around it, and hopefully dry before any mould gets to it. Woo, that was a badly stooped stook, wasn't it? You'd make a good farmer, you would. It's now raining. 
If this had happened before, we couldn't have cut it. I mean, it's a miracle. Come on, Peter, get off a bit less. <laughs> but not all the wheat is cut and stooked. A small clump remains. Professor Ronald Hutton has returned to the farm to explain a strange Victorian ritual. Late Victorian scholars themselves thought that a spirit lived in the corn in which ancient peoples believed. And of course, as you cut more and more of the crop, the spirit retreats into the last bit. So that particular stand of crop is infused with this vital element that's actually quite dangerous, and that's why you dare not approach too close. You mm -hmm. fling things from afar, or you try and get it blindfolded. That's the mystical interpretation. That sounds very Victorian. But Professor Hutton believes that there's a much simpler explanation for the ritual. Harvesting a crop, as you've discovered, is really difficult work, and so everyone's really elated when you get to the end of it, and you want to make a big thing of it. I'd like to be the first to volunteer Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you don't need your ankles in the future. <laughs> no, there we all, go. Now we're all just going to pop them ah! in the pub. <laughs> and you let us know when you've finished. I turn Ruth round a few times and give her the scythe and then take cover. Oh. Right. One. Oh, it's like dancing. It's just very nice. It is very elegant. <laughs> Three. Oh. Whoa, whoa, that's a stoop. That's a stoop. That was 12 o'clock. You want 6 o'clock. Ah. Another stoop, oh, Ronald. <laughs> It's behind you, Ruth. Okay, behind it. Right. That was... yeah. 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 Oh, I'm so rubbish at this. No, you're not. <laughs> With the last of the wheat cut, it's time to celebrate. <laughs> All over the British Isles, the last sheaf is given a name. Uh, the maiden, the crone, the baby, uh, the hare. In Shropshire, it's called the mare. Don't know why. Oh. That's its nickname. And what you do is you shout. I have her, I have her, I have her, in a Shropshire accent. And we three guys shout, uh, what has thee, what has thee, what has thee? And you shout, a mare, a mare, a mare. You want to try that? OK, so. I have her, I have her, I have her! What, what has thee, what has thee, what has thee? A mare, a mare, a mare! Wonderful. Well done. <laughs> They'd have heard that in the neighbouring farm who won't have finished their harvesting, and you will feel great at having yeah, shown no, them up. No, no. <laughs> Marbu sucks to you. So what do I do with this now, then? Well, in Shropshire, you probably wouldn't have made it into a corn dolly. Oh. They do that elsewhere. Right. So you stick it up in your house as a trophy. You can plait it, you can put ribbons in it, you can put flowers in it. You do what makes you feel good about having <laughs> done so well. It's your achievement. The farmers must now wait three weeks for the sheaves of wheat to dry out before they can be brought in from the field. If they're stored damp, they'll rot. There's no clever Victorian machine to do this job, so plenty of extra labour will be needed. Fingers crossed Ruth's poster works. While they wait, it's time for Peter, Ruth and Alex to move out of the farm where they've lived as Victorians for the past year. It's truly... a uh a life-enhancing experience, maybe even a life-altering experience. It's, it's going to be very, very hard to leave this place. Very hard indeed. The final job on the Victorian farm is to bring in the harvest. In the wheat fields, there's been an excellent response to Ruth's poster and there's no shortage of help. We've managed to enlist an army of Victorian labourers to help us load our dray. The only problem is, is Peter and I have never done this before. <laughs> As so... with most things. <laughs> Looks like the poster worked. We seem to want loads of people to give us a hand. Thank you. Thanks. How's it going, Peter? It's going very well. Like many hands make light work. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we might just get it all on. We're just using the sort of time-honoured implement of the rural scene, the uh, pico, or pitchfork, as it's more popularly known. And it quite literally, all it does is just pitches 
stuff up to us. Thrashing box before. Oh, it lasts a bit of sun, eh, Ruth? Yeah. Eventually. 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 <laughs> the way we're stacking this dray is we're putting it stalk side out. Because that means the head of the grain is in the middle of the dray, so if you lose any, it's still on your dray. With all the stooks loaded, it's time for gleaning, collecting any stray stalks of wheat left in the field. For very poor families, this was deeply important to their yearly economy. If you were good at gleaning and you followed the fields from farm to farm, you could get several months' worth of bread corn for free. The 19th century saw the birth of photography, for the first time accurately illustrating everyday rural scenes like this. Today, these images give us a window into a lost age. Photographer Chris Vile has come to the farm to take a picture of our harvest with a Victorian plate camera. Hi, Chris. Thanks ever so much for coming along. No trouble. Why would photographers be so interested then in, in harvesting this sort of everyday activity? The majority of photographers' work was undoubtedly taking portraits, um, but two things had changed. A, the materials had become much cheaper and more mass produced. But I think also photographers in the early days saw themselves often as artists and they're in that sort of romantic tradition. And maybe as a, as a reaction to the sort of increasing industrialization of the countryside that we're seeing, um, they wanted to capture that rural life. Right, stand still for a few seconds. Last September, the team threshed wheat, removing grain to be sold to make bread. Now they're leaving a wheat crop to be threshed by the next tenants of the farm. The sun On the way to the farmyard, there's a steep hill to negotiate, a real test for the repaired wheel. As we're going down the brow of the hill, we're attaching a slipper, which is going to break the cart so the cart isn't going to run away with the horses. Oh, I feel as safe as ours is up here. Celebrating the end of harvest has been a custom across Europe ever since history began. It's a chance for the workers to be repaid with free-flowing beer and food, accompanied by folk musician John Kirkpatrick. For the poor, it's an opportunity to get decent food and beer. Mr Acton and his son Rupert have been the Victorian farm's landlords all year and have come along to join in the celebrations. <laughs> Mr Acton! Mr Acton, how lovely to come and join us. Oh, well, as you can see... Mr Acton? A harvest. And the, here is the, uh, the last sheet as well. It looks a healthy sample. It does. There's a little bit of, a little bit of weed in here. <laughs> <laughs> we <thought> we'd <laughs> <that>. <laughs> can we offer you a drink? I didn't mean to slur that. <laughs> now the moment of truth. Time to taste Peter's beer. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> You're Be <very> honest. <laughs> Quite an acceptable flavour. <laughs> Jolly good. Mm, that is nice, Peter. All things considered, and I think that's a, a damn good home brew, that. You drinking the same beer as I am. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's an opportunity as well to say a big thank you to yes, everyone that helped us with the harvest today. So, yes. uh, a big thanks to everyone. Thank Cheers. Thank you very much. Cheers. And I've got one last very sad duty to do. I've got to give you that back. That's, That's very kind of you. A really. very thank sad very moment much. for me. The key to the cottage. <laughs> well, I'm sure the cottage is in a lot better state now than it was when you arrived. You might have the key, but we've changed the locks. Squatter's <laughs> 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 right. Yes, yes. <laughs>
Now there came three men from the West, me boys, their fortunes for to try. And these three men made a solemn vow, John Barleycorn must die. So they bowed him deep in the furrows, and they sowed right over his head. And these three men home rejoicing went, John Barleycorn was dead. Victorian harvest festivals were notoriously boozy and uproarious affairs. It's not long before the drinking games start. It's time to leave the Victorian farm and say goodbye to a way of life from an age gone by. Down. We have poured our heart and soul into this project and that is the reason why it's going to be so hard to leave. One thing that stood out has been bringing new life into the world. And out of all that new life, I think the pigs are those I've been closest to. These little Gloucester Old Spot piglets are now five days old. As a historian and archaeologist, I've spent an inordinate amount of time reading about the past and, and excavating the past, but this was an opportunity to do it for real and um, just to have the insights into day-to-day -day country life back in the 19th century. How am I doing then? You're doing very well. I suppose if I had to pick out one thing that I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed from this year, um, it's going to have been working with the heavy horses. Um, such a, a massive thrill um, to work with such graceful beasts and it's certainly something I'll be looking to do when I leave the farm. We've been really lucky too to have a chance to get involved in all the sort of crafts of the countryside, the things that you need to make and do to support life on a Victorian farm. I mean, the basket making was just, it was a joy to behold. You do get a very real sense, though, of, of how in the kind of modern age we, we really have lost touch with the countryside. You know, just all the different types of wood and trees and plants and grasses that to Victorian farmers would have been second nature. But they're virtually alien to the kind of, the, 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 the people of today. There's a, a huge weight of sadness about finishing doing all this. But then I'm also really excited because it's thrown up so many ideas. Well, this is the end of our Victorian adventure. I'm going to really miss this place. 